Hi everyone, welcome to this M2D2 talk. Our speaker today is Matteo Aldegui, who is currently senior researcher scientist at Google Research. He was previously a research scientist at MIT. He obtained his PhD in computational biochemistry at the University of Oxford. After that, he worked at the Max Planck Institute for Biophysical Chemistry and the Veterinary Institute of AI as a postdoctoral fellow. Matthew will be presenting today his work on the roughness of the molecular property landscapes and uh, his impact on modeling. Thank you so much, Matthew, for accepting our, invite, our invitation to speak uh, with us today. And uh, we can jump right in. All right, thank you for the intro. Um, so first of all, like a little disclaimer. So again, like as Prince said, I'm working at Google, but today I'm here in a personal capacity. So I will talk only exclusively about the work I did previously. Um, so prior joining Google, and in particular about some of the work I did um, at MIT. And as Prudential mentioned, it concerns uh, sort of a roughness of molecular property landscapes and how uh, sort of we model structural property relationships in, in chemoinformatics. Um, something I should mention is that, yes, I don't have that many slides. So if you, and, and I understand it's a fairly um, sort of informal talk. So if you guys want to ask any question, kind of feel free to, um, you know, post in the chat or just interrupt me. To give a bit of a um, sort of brief intro and kind of mention what are these molecular property landscapes, for people that maybe haven't heard of them before, um, effectively, this is the idea of, um, you know, the fact that we can take some molecular structures of different, uh, you know, drugs, but could be really any, any kind of um, sort of uh, any molecule for any application could be any other property. And if we map them onto a 2D plane, um, so that, you know, the distances somewhat represent how similar or different each molecule is from each other. And on the Z axis, um, on the third axis, we have uh, the property could be like the biological activity. Then effectively, we obtain something that resembles a bit like a natural landscape, you know, kind of where you see mountains and valleys and so on. And um, this has been used quite a lot in chemoinformatics in order to analyze sort of qualitatively or semi-quantitatively kind of how easy it is to model uh, and how predictable, um, you know, how it is to model a property and how predictable the property changes with changes in, in structure. So again, like for, for a chemist, it might be more intuitive that, you know, if you make a small change, you should expect a small change in property, but this is not always the case. And perhaps it's a little bit better represented in the picture on the right, which is from a paper from the BioEarth group, where we can see again, like we have X and Y that are our sort of descriptor space for our molecules of interest, and then we have activity. And then we can see that we might have some uh, sort of smoother regions, some more rugged regions where the property changes faster as we move in between molecules and so-called activity cliffs that um, they're mentioned quite often in drug design, which is when you have a small change in, um, in the molecule, but you have a big change in, um, in activity, in biological activity. And this could be, uh, you know, here, could, this could be the output of some machine learning model, like a surface that is built by, uh, by a machine learning model based on some, um, some data. And again, the idea here is that, you know, if you have different molecules or different regions of chemical space, if you have one that is smoother, um, you know, the hypothesis that is that it's easier to optimize, like the chemist, again, can more easily guess how the affinity or the biological activity changes, in particular because Again, in drug design, you might want to optimize for other properties. And as you change the molecule to optimize the other properties, you might want to try and guess or retain the same affinity. So you don't want that typically if you don't want to make a small change that gives you better, I don't know, solubility, but then all of a sudden um, you don't have any activity anymore. So you would like ideally, again, uh, to move into the smooth region or at least the hypothesis is that if we move into the smooth, you know, among regions that are more smooth, it's more predictable. So, and this is clearly, there is clearly a relationship between roughness or smoothness. So the, the geometry of this um, landscape and how easy it is to model for a machine learning model. So again, if you think about a rougher surface where we have um, the property that really changes kind of very rapidly with small changes in uh, chemical structure, you can imagine that it should be harder or it might be tougher for a machine learning model to learn these kind of relationships. Uh, whereas if everything is pretty smooth, and gradual, it should be 
uh, a fairly straightforward learning task. And as I mentioned before, um, activity cliffs um, are very closely related. So if you hear about molecular property landscapes, activity cliffs is a feature of this landscape. So it's very closely related. Uh, people talk about structure activity um, relationships or structural property relationships, just to kind of property is just a way to generalize the structure, the idea of structure activity relationship a bit more broadly. And all of these concepts are very closely related. So again, intuitively, we know that, or like intuitively, we can say, well, rougher pro molecular property landscapes should be harder to model. So it should be a harder property to predict. Um, and indeed, people, again, this is not really a new concept. A lot of people have done um, sort of work in this area. And there are a number of indices that try to capture um, in a kind of in a simple way um, what are what is the roughness of a, uh, of a landscape or how hard it is to model. Um, or just to identify these activity cliffs. And um, again, often perhaps use um, more retrospectively than prospectively, but there is definitely quite some work. And these here just picked three cases or three examples that are perhaps the, so the one that have, be, have been a bit more popular. Um, but just to give an idea, so we have, for instance, the structure activity landscape, which is a pairwise um, index. So we take, uh, effectively, it is the, the slope, um, you know, it's kind of a different, difference in property between two molecules. Uh, over the distance between the two molecules. So it's really like how, um, basically how steep the slope between the two points is. And this is used just to identify activity landscapes. Again, you have like um, activity cliffs. So you have a lot of molecules and it's pairwise. So you end up with basically a matrix of, uh, you know, N2N for N molecules. And then you can identify where, um, you know, where activity really changes the most um, in between molecules. Um, the SARI, so Structure Activity Relationship Index, tries to capture more of the global character of the whole molecular landscape. So again, this is not pairwise, but you know, it, apply, it gives you one number for a data set. I'm not explicitly saying what the two scores are because these are quite sort of long and would fill up the slide, but basically you have a continuity and discontinuity score. So the continuity score looks at the average, um, uh, effectively the average similarity score using, using the tiny motor index uh, between, between molecules and is weighted uh, by a function that depends on the potency. And the discontinuity score focuses a bit more on molecules that are actually similar to each other and looks at what is the potency difference, what is the biological activity difference between molecules that are uh, fairly close to each other. So it applies like a um, Tanimoto similarity cutoff, only looks at the molecules that are similar to each other, and then says, well, among these, what is the potency difference? Um, so again, this gives a more um, sort of global score of uh, roughness um, for the data set. However, it has a few limitations simply because, again, there are a few hyperparameters, right? So we need to define cutoffs specifically based on Tanimoto similarities. And it's also focused very much on biological activity. So um, again, it can't really be applied to um, other molecular property that are not um, sort of relevant for drug design. Maybe, you know, they're designing material or some, some other um, using molecules from, sub, for some other application. And also finally, the two scores are not really exactly on the same scale. So they need to be standardized based on a set of standard data sets. Um, I think in the original paper, they use 16 or so um, sort of SAR data sets from the literature. But of course, depending on, on how you standardize the scores, you might get slightly different results. Um, the last um, the last one I wanted to mention is this MODI or modelability index, which again kind of looks more um, also like they the, the look more at how does this correlate with the ability of machine learning model to classify in this particular case molecules. This is more specific for classification and effectively looks at all of the nearest neighbor pairs in the data set. And basically is the fraction of pairs that are within the same class as opposed to being in opposite classes. And it just takes an average across classes. So this is a bit more focused on classification and has been expanded to regression as well. Uh, in the second paper mentioned here, let me, let me grab this. Yeah. Yeah, the second yeah. paper here. Yeah, go ahead, Prudential. I have a small question. So in yeah. practice, what people rely on the most I, is it the, the modi score or the other two ones? Because like, the other two ones, like because they have this definition of distance or they assume that you need a distance, distance depends on what algorithm you use, what representation, 
Uh, I was just wondering what people use most in, in practice. Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, I am not sure how much these are used in practice, um, you know, in, in sort of drug discovery or research, simply because they tend to be, I think, most applied retrospectively. And this, I think, is a big question that I will kind of, I will come to the end uh, to this. I'm not entirely sure how you apply this really prospectively. I would say perhaps the SARI score seems to be the one at least has been cited the most and seems to be more referenced the most. Um, so this seems to be perhaps a bit more popular, but I think it's partly because of the task. So the task is like regression on biological activity um, is probably a bit more common than, um, or like it's, it's, an, it's a task that everybody does in drug discovery. Uh, whereas maybe the classification is a bit simply a bit less and also has been kind of published more recently. Um, so if I had to guess one, I would say sorry, but really it's not, to be honest, I don't know exactly how they're used prospectively, as opposed to retrospectively, that is, I have this data set, um, you know, maybe I can um, explain why it was hard to optimize this molecule. Um, let's take the, uh, Lance, you have a question? Uh, yeah, I have a question about the concept of smoothness and uh, uh, yeah, yeah, this uh, cliff. So from the coordinates, it seems like uh, the, the descriptors are kind of arbitrary. So I'm just wondering if you change the different yeah, uh, descriptors, could uh, like a smooth place become a cliff or something like that? Yes, so that is a good point. I will come to it actually in the next slide. And yes, so because of how chemical space is defined or not particularly well defined, so the way you define distances between molecules, you would change the smoothness of roughness. So it is indeed a question of representation as well. Um, I will actually yeah, go a bit more into detail there, so we'll have a longer answer. Um, but the short answer is yes. Yeah, it would change depending on how you, you change the representation. Um, a big so we want to remove the activity cliff in the chart. Um, compounds which make the models difficult. The challenge, we don't have an algorithm to extrapolate. Oh, I see, okay. Um, yeah, basically saying that uh, every time I touch the chat, uh, the, the screen goes away. But yeah, so basically, I guess he's saying that you know you want to remove some of the activity clips because they are challenging for a machine learning model to model. Uh, but of course, if you remove them, then it's still hard to you know it's still still hard to extrapolate. Um, and I think I think it's a valid argument, but. At the same time, ideally, I would like a machine learning model that does mod can model the activity clips, but of course, it's a natural feature of landscape, and it might be harder to model. And it's also kind of hard to know that, you know, if if you use a purely statistical model, if you don't have data um, for that activity cliff, again, chances are that you're going to miss it. Um, so yeah, it's not it's not like a, I guess there's not a straightforward answer, at least from my perspective, on how you would use this. Um, um, Kind of aside from a from an analysis point of view, or kind of analyzing a data set. But going to um, so I guess the, the kind of overview here is to say that there are a lot of different indices, but um, we thought that they were still missing something, right? Because some are just pairwise, but we want something that is more general. Uh, SI, SAR index is more general, but it's very much um, limited to biological activity and also has a, a quite a few hyperparameters that you need to set that it seems to be a little arbitrary. Modi has really been thought for classification, so it doesn't apply as neatly to regression. It's been applied to regression, but um, in a more complex way where you binarize the data set multiple times and you treat your regression, uh, regression problem as a classification problem. So we thought maybe we can try and revisit this idea and come up with some other measure of roughness. Um, that basically gives us a number, and, and hopefully this number will correlate to the error of the machine learning model, just because going back, we, we said, well, there is this, at least intuitive, I'm sure there, there is probably a way to formalize this a bit, a bit better uh, in, a, in a mathematical way to say, well, if, this, if the, uh, so the geometry of this space is very rough, a machine learning model should struggle to, um, to kind of make good predictions effectively. One of the challenges, um, kind of how, how Lan, kind of Lance mentioned actually, um, is that if you if you look in the literature for roughness, um, you know, also across other fields, like maybe geology or surface science, uh, 
Um, typically, roughness is defined for Euclidean spaces. So uh, you have a clear measure of distance, and then you kind of, um, you know, there is a, a, a very clear metric that tells you how distant, to, how, how far apart two points are. But when we deal with chemical space, we don't really have this, right? So, um, you know, at, I guess at best we can describe chemical space as a metric space where what we have is simply a distance measure between two points. And we have basically all of the pairwise distances. But even this distance, there isn't one natural um, measure of distance that, you know, is clearly um, kind of the, the default one. Uh, there are a lot of different um, sort of representations and distances one can use, and they're all equally justifiable. Again, you could use fingerprints to describe, um, you know, binary fingerprints to describe uh, molecules, or you could use descriptors, or you could use some embeddings of a pre-trained model, and all of these are fairly valid uh, approaches. In the same way, again, you can use Tanimotor or Jakar distance, you can use different p-norms. Um, you basically can measure, you have a different metric for distance, and every time you change this, your space effectively changes, which is one of the challenges here. Um, <clears throat> but effectively, I guess the kind of takeaway message is that the only information we have is potentially pairwise distances between points. We don't really have absolute things like absolute positions and the uh, property associated with them. So we wanted to come up with something that um, could be applied to this. And again, we, we were looking at slightly different fields. Um, and the concept that seemed to be most useful, or at least we found more, most useful, at least at the intuitive, intuitive level, was the concept of fractal dimension. Um, and again, like very uh, approximately, um, is basically an index that measures um, how complex an object is um, by looking at how the specific pattern changes uh, at, the at the scale at which it is measured. So I think the easiest is to look at the typical example, which is like the roughness of uh, the coastline. So here we have Britain, and we can measure the length of uh, the coastline by using a stick of a certain length, like here, right? So we we always have to approximate it based on some finite um, sort of measuring unit, effectively. And then we can say, well, this is a bit of a coarse way of approximating the um, the the coastline. So we can use like a shorter stick, which is more precise. And then as you do that, you will capture more of the uh, kind of the complexities of the of the coastline and the length of the overall coastline it would be longer. And as you keep doing this, you will see that the coastline, the measure, the, uh, the, you know, the property you're measuring, which is, again, the length here of the coastline becomes longer as you uh, use a more and more precise measure. Um, and again, you can kind of intuitively see how the rate at which um, the, the length increases as you change the length of a stick tells you something about the complexity of the uh, and the roughness of this coastline. Because if the coastline was very smooth, every time you split in half the sticks, you would just overlap them on the ones that are already present effectively. They wouldn't change too much. So that means that the, your estimate of the length of the coastline would be similar and you know it's not changing really much. Whereas like in this case, because the coastline is very rough, every time you split the um, sort of the length of the stick, you end up positioning them in a different in a different place, and you capture again all of the ins and outs of the um, sort of the very uh, rough parts of the coastline again at an intuitive level. Um, and what we did is just to take this concept again in a uh, fairly in a, in a fairly loose loose way and apply it to molecular data sets. Um, again, if there are people that are a bit more mathematically inclined, I'm sure that there are more rigorous ways to actually take this idea and apply them to molecular data sets. But what we did effectively was to say, well, this is a concept that kind of makes sense. Maybe we can apply it to data sets to come up with a score um, that doesn't really have much, many hyperparameters and gives us a number which represents the global character um, of, the, um, of the roughness of the surface. And hopefully it will correlate with machine learning model error. So the way um, we did this, so again, if you think about measuring the um, sort of the length of the coastline there, we kind of effectively coarse grained uh, our uh, sort of measuring st stick. And here what we do, we coarse grain the data set. Um, effectively, if we look at the first row here, every point is a molecule. We can imagine it's a molecule. And to create like fake coarse grained data sets, we can cluster them um, using a clustering algorithm. And we use in particular like uh, hierarchical clustering with uh, sort of complete linkage. So, um, you know, if we have clusters and we say, well, our threshold for clustering is 
every two molecules within that cluster would, would be at most 0.25 from each other. So we define the maximum distance um, the two molecules can be within a cluster. And then once we do the clustering, we can define a fictitious molecule effectively, which has the average property of the molecules in the, cl in the cluster. And so this is kind of our measuring stick and how we kind of basically here we go from more precise to more coarse grained. You can go the other way around. Um, and the property we are measuring here is not the length of a coastline, but we are looking at, because we want to see how a property changes, we're looking at distribution or like the dispersion of property of interest. So the second uh, row here would be any property. Um, you know, you can imagine as, um, again, biological activity, but it could be anything else. And we're just looking at the standard deviation. So how dispersed it is. And as we cluster it, um, we assign the fictitious centroid molecule of the cluster. Um, we assign the average property of its own cluster. And then um, if we look at the dispersion of the coarse grained um, data set, um, we can see that effectively the dispersion shrinks. So, you know, at, at the easiest is to look at the other extreme. If we have one single cluster, we don't have any, you know, no, there's no dispersion. Every mo you know, we only have one molecule, one super molecule, let's say, um, with, with one uh, value, which is the average property of the whole data set. And because every, um, because when we look at the cluster, basically the uh, the fictitious molecule is weighted by the size of the cluster, we are guaranteed that actually the standard deviation always decreases. So as we go through this procedure of course, graining the data set and taking like the dispersion of average values, uh, we know that we're gonna go from the uh, original standard deviation of the data set to zero effectively. So what we wanted to do is to measure the rate of change in some way, um, a bit like, you know, people do it again in the concept of fractal dimension. And the simplest way we thought to do it is just to look at the, just integrate the area under the curve. So here we have like, um, kind of, we start at, we, on the x-axis, we have this threshold that we use for clustering. So at zero, we are at zero, and we, fo we follow the loss in dispersion in this case. So actually, um, we kind of look at, instead of the sigma t, we just look at the sigma zero minus sigma t. And as we can see, we kind of cluster and we just track how much dispersion we're losing and we just sum it up. So this is just looking at the area under the curve here. So it's a very simple score. Um, the, the two here is simply just to normalize so that to make sure it's always between zero and one. And we show an example of what happens when it's zero and what happens when it's one. Um, and this is because we're assuming kind of normalized distances and, um, and property values. Uh, it will still work like, and this is just to put different properties on the same scale, but something to keep in mind is that if you have two data sets for the same property, you might want to think how you normalize um, kind of the data across two data sets to make them comparable. But generally speaking, again, it's, it's a fairly simple uh, score that we kind of came up by hand. Um, and again, there, there are probably other ways of doing this. But just to give an idea of how it behaves, um, and again, here we're looking at the area under this curve. If we have a data sets of molecules, and again, all the points are molecules and the color are roughly representing you know, different uh, property values. So here they're all orange. The property values are the same across the whole data set. So um, it's completely flat, so it should be smooth. And this is where we have like a rogue value of zero. Uh, the area under, under the curve is zero because basically there's no roughness at all. I guess this is what we consider the smoothest um, landscape is just totally flat. At the other opposite end, here we have a data set where you cannot actually see the other colors because the two molecules or like the blue dots are effectively on top of uh, red dots, which means that every nearest neighbor has opposite property value, which is basically saying, basically everything is an activity cliff. Um, and this is the most rough data set allowed effectively, uh, which has a error under the curve of one. And then we can, for instance, here, we are adding noise to the position of the um, red dots to the molecules that are supposed to be on top of each other. So they start becoming a bit more separate from the, um, from the blue ones. And then we can see that we start decreasing from the rogue value of one. So it's slightly less rough because now some of the nearest neighbors actually are not, don't have opposite values. And the more noise we add, the more we tend to kind of a, um, kind of the, more, the more we move away from a uh, value of one. And this is just to give you an idea of the two extreme cases, if that if that makes sense. And maybe let me stop and ask if there are like questions here. Um, 
All right. One okay. question. Yeah. What distance measured do you use here? Oh, yeah. So here I'm just, just for the purpose of this example, this is really like a, on a, on a two coordinates and I'm using Euclidean distance. So this is really just, um, I guess, trying to put the points on, on the plane here and the distances should represent the distances that kind of you naturally think of when you look at these points. So this is like a L2 distance, yeah. Um, and and for molecule, what what will you use then? I guess a structural fingerprint or centimeter distance kind of. Exactly. So it it will depend a lot on distances and how you define effectively your chemical space. And this is something I think that is very intrinsic to the problem and cannot be fixed to some extent. So in in the test that we'll show later, we use fingerprints and descriptors. And for fingerprints, we use Tanimoto distance. For descriptors, we use Euclidean distance between the two vectors. Um, but you could use like L1 distances. You could use cosine distances between the two vectors. Um, you could use any representation you want. So this is this is kind of the input of, of this score. Um, and I think there's no way, at least I feel like there's no way around it, because this is really the way you define your chemical space. Um, so you, you have to have this distance matrix function that tells you how, how far apart two points are. Um, so this is kind of external, but as you will see, like maybe I, I can mention it later, it does affect the score you get because you have a dif different distribution of distances that the, the chemical space is, is kind of structured in a different way, whether you use descriptors or fingerprints or, or some other approach. Uh, let me see in the chat. Can you explain how you go from the standard deviation to the roughness score? Yes. Yeah, so <clears throat> we're looking at the how much standard deviation we lose. So delta t, let's say for this data set is 0.24. So here we're just starting, delta, we consider uh, yeah, 0.24 and here we go to 0.18. So in the plot down here, this would go, you know, we would lose like 0 0.06, right? And so this is the loss, this is the, Kind of the term within this parenthesis. So this is the loss in dispersion. Uh, we go from the original value to zero, and it's all, it's always monotonically decreasing. Um, so this is this is it basically. So we we just monitor that. We know it goes from zero to one because we are looking at normalized distances. So this integral is from zero to one, or it could be from zero to why well, it doesn't matter or from like the maximal distance effectively. Um, and we just sum it up, right? So here we have like one, two, three, four steps and we just take the area under this curve effectively um, so the only thing we're looking at this the standard deviation we're losing how much standard deviation we are losing while we cluster the data set and we replace the original data set with a fictitious one that is clustered um, where every centroid has the property value that is the average of its own cluster um, and basically yeah that's that's how uh, we ended up with the score and it's guaranteed to be one simply because, again, with normalized distances and, um, and property values, we go from zero to one in terms of uh, threshold for course grade for um, the clustering. Um, and also, again, like the if you have like a property range, the maximal standard deviation for their property range is half of the range. So we multiply by two just to normalize it. But basically also like we can't go above one here. So, you know, the the this, the smallest number is zero and the biggest number is one, if that makes sense. It's a little bit confusing, I guess, maybe if you hear about it for the first time, but um, if you kind of look at it for a while, it, it is actually fairly simple. It's not a complex idea, yeah. Let's see some more questions. Um, you have a data set, how we use Rogi to build the machine learning model. So it's not used to build the machine learning model, but as, you, as I will show later, um, it kind of predicts how accurate your machine learning model can get roughly uh, on, on a particular data set. So if you have two data sets, it should tell you if one is rougher and one is smoother, that number correlates with the um, sort of test set error that you get with the machine learning model, uh, at least for interpolation. Could Rogi be used in a regression scenario? Yes, so this is exactly the uh, one of the reasons we wanted to use it mostly in a regression scenario. I will show later it applies also for binary classification, but we 
thought about it mostly for regression. Um, all right. I will move ahead. And I think some of this question about the sort of kind of machine learning um, model become a little more clear um, later on. And again, just to give a couple of more examples and thinking about behavior, this, this is again kind of qualitatively taking a look and kind of see whether the roughness we can imagine for very simple toy data sets that we can come up with and we can come up with them in a way that we kind of know intuitively one is rougher than the other one, whether the score we get tracks with this intuition. So here we can <clears throat> define analytical functions and the first three are more like regression problems and this the second set of three is more like a classification problem where we try to increase the roughness going left to right. And I guess on the on the three on the right is a little bit like having um, a data set that has more and more activity cliffs effectively. So we have like a binary response here. So we can actually, um, you know, to simulate a, uh, um, these are 2D uh, surfaces, we can simulate a data set by just drawing uniformly at random from these um, sort of 2D spaces uh, and create a data set where we, again, we look at Euclidean distance here. Um, and then we can compute the ROGI score, as I mentioned before, this roughness score, looking at the area under the curve of basically how much dispersion do we lose when we cluster the data set. And we have this with these plots effectively. And roughly we can see that it tracks with the intuition where um, sort of F1 is less rough than F2 and then it's slightly less rough than F3. And similarly on the right, F6 should be pretty rough because it's kind of all like a big activity cliff uh, to some extent and we get a fairly large uh, score. Even though again, we still have, uh, we still have like some room to go to like the, the kind of worst case scenarios. Um, yeah, and as I will show later, in, in practice, real data sets are typically not like this. Um, they're a bit more like in this kind of regime, a bit like a bit more smooth. Um, so going to the kind of what, you know, how is machine learning model, where do they come in and then how we use them? And here is because we wanted to capture the roughness, but there is no ground truth roughness measure for a molecular data set. So we just kind of tested the approach by saying, well, if the intuition that um, sort of roughness should correlate with machine learning model error. If we train a machine learning model, we do cross validation. Um, we can take, you know, the average, uh, the mean root mean square error across folds. We should be getting a correlation between our measure of roughness and how uh, challenging the task is effectively for a machine learning model. How much, how much, how large the error is making is. So this is for the six sort of fake toy data sets I showed before. So fairly simple test cases. Um, we can draw many samples, right? Because we have like, we have the ground truth in continuous space. We can draw many samples and actually compute the roughness score. And also at the same time, we can train it. We can, you know, in this case is a random forest regressor. Um, and we do tenfold cross validation. And we just see what is the error the model is making on the test set. So here we have effectively the average of many um, sort of many repeated scenarios. Basically, we draw the second row here many times, and every time it looks slightly differently. Um, and on the y-axis, we have the average error that we made, um, sort of the cross-validation error of the random forest model. And we can see that, you know, we, we kind of saw that roughly for these simple cases, there was actually a pretty good correlation between um, saying, okay, this, this surface is very rough, and the model is making more error. And you can imagine why. So if we if we look at this particular surface here, um, you know, particular for a random forest, um, if you don't have like the complete picture or like a lot of data, you can immediately see that it's kind of very easy to make fairly large errors because you might have a data point in the kind of trying to predict something in the red spot, but you don't have data, then you would predict that is blue, kind of kind of the opposite property value. Um, and this is only for 50 data points. Um, but there is something interesting to be uh, noticed as well is that in particular here, we can control very well how many data points we have. So we can say, well, we could collect 250 data points or a thousand data points. And if you think about it, the roughness of the surface should be constant because we're trying to estimate it. Um, but eventually if you take like loads and loads of compounds or if you consider the whole continuous surface, it is a fixed number. It's not gonna change depending whether you have a thousand points or 50 data points. Um, you know, it, you might have an error in the estimate, but it should converge to a number. Whereas the um, error of a machine learning model should decrease the more data you have. So there is this effect of data set size. Um, and we can see it here. Basically, if we look at um, sort of the errors, we can see if we consider a thousand data points on average, we make um, sort of, a, we have a lower 
uh, root mean square error from this random forest model, even though the roughness score is, is roughly similar. And this is just kind of to show that even though we maintain the correlation, given a specific data set size, this is something to keep in mind. If you have two data sets of very different sizes, the um, sort of, and you want to try and predict the model error, uh, it, basically the size of the data sets is a, is a bit of a confounding factor, right? Because again, like uh, the roughness doesn't change, but the model would be more precise, the more data you have. So this is just um, something to keep in mind and I will show it later on, on kind of real data sets. So for testing, we actually uh, then decided to use more real life data sets. So we had three sets of data sets. So one is zinc. We just sampled 2000 molecules at random and used guacamole, which is basically um, an, an, a set of oracles that are um, sort of computed properties for, for molecules. And there, it's used as a, um, as a benchmark, um, benchmark uh, test for generative models. The therapeutic data commons is, uh, and these are the zinc and guacamole is mostly physical chemical properties. We have 13 data sets from therapeutic data commons, which is more pharmacokinetic and toxicological properties. And these are all experimental. And then we took a, a data sets that we, we call Campbell, which really has been uh, uh, collected and curated by uh, the group of Francesca Grisoni. Um, and basically they curated uh, 30 Campbell data sets. And this is all SAR. So this is all uh, ligand binding affinity data. And also is experimental. And what we wanted to do is to see whether machine learning models um, you know, trained on these data sets, what is the error they're making and how does this error compare to the roughness that we are measuring with this, with this index? So first of all, very qualitatively and visually, we can actually look at this molecular property landscape. So here we're using um, a set of 15 or so physical chemical descriptors in two dimensions. And on the third dimension, we have the, uh, the property we're looking at. And here we have like a few of these therapeutic data commons properties. Um, and roughly we can see that the first one here, it has like a couple of peaks and activity cliffs, but it's fairly uh, flat on average and we get a fairly low uh, roughness index. And at the opposite end, we have something that is basically kind of impossible for a machine learning model really to predict. It's super rough, um, uh, at least using the descriptors we used to, to kind of plot this in 2D. Um, and we have a rogue value of 56, which is more on the rougher end. So at least, and, and in, this is hydration free energy is in the middle. So this is just to give you an idea that while well, we can plot these data sets, look at the actual landscapes, and you can do this by using something like uh, multidimensional scaling to project the sort of higher dimension descriptors onto the 2D plane, while at the same time you try to preserve pairwise distances, like the proportion of pairwise distances. So kind of saying, you want to keep, you know, you want to visualize the distances in 2D, but you want to maintain as much fidelity as possible with respect to the higher dimensional space that you can visualize easily. Um, but going to perhaps a more um, sort of central result is to is kind of to look at it a bit more uh, quantitatively. And again, if we here we can consider um, effectively we have five different machine learning models covering different classes. So we thought we well, let's take near uh, some nearest neighbor. Um, some linear model, random forest, some kernel approach, and a um, small neural network. And as we mentioned before, we can represent molecules in different ways. So in, in the first row, we are using fingerprints and Tanimoto distance. And in the second case, we're using a set of 15, 16 physical chemical descriptors and just using Euclidean distance between the, the different vectors uh, to compute the roughness, this roughness metric, the roughness score. Um, and then on the x-axis, we have, again, this roughness index, um, which, as you might see, actually is on different scale. And again, this is affected by the fact that um, sort of fingerprints, if you look at the space, they tend to put molecules very far from each other. So the distribution of distances is more towards one because molecules tend to be more far from each other. Whereas in the descriptor space, we chose everything is a little bit more Gaussian and close to a, a kind of a, a center point. Um, um, which, which makes the roughness index a bit larger because then you have like the same property differences between molecules, but in one case you have like tighter distances and the other case farther apart distances, um, if that makes sense. But the kind of the, the, the core um, sort of takeaway message here is that if on the x-axis we have the root mean square error of the cross-validation, so this is, we're always using random cross-validation. So again, always testing in this case, the interpolative 
uh, ability of the model. Uh, we're not going to, um, we haven't tested them in, in an extrapolation setting because I don't think it would really apply very much, it wouldn't really work to be honest. Um, but the, um, um, the idea here is that we can see that the roughness in this generally speaking correlates pretty well with the error that the machine learning models tend to make. So again, here is split in three data sets. So we have three sets of data sets. So we have like zinc in yellow, therapeutic data commons for, for sort of pharmacokinetic properties in red and Campbell um, sort of ligand binding affinity in, in blue. Um, and again, aside from specific scenario, generally speaking, there is a pretty good correlation between this idea of roughness and, uh, and model error, which again, kind of it is what intuitively um, we thought it should happen, but it's nice to see that uh, kind of it tracks fairly quantitatively as well. Here I'm plotting also, by the way, the data set size, just because I mentioned this before, there is this um, issue of comparing data sets of different sizes. And here we go from about data sets of maybe 500 compounds up to 10,000, but it doesn't seem to be too much of an error here. Um, however, it can be an error in the, um, it can be a confounding factor in the classification um, scenario. So here is about 50 classification data sets from the therapeutic data commons. So again, kind of different absorption, you know, add me properties. And here we're looking at the um, sort of accuracy uh, of, the, of the model. And by accuracy, I mean the, the binary accuracy. So on, on how like each data, how each point has been classified. So these are all binary data sets. And we have the roughness index on the, on the X axis. Um, and also in this case, we can see that there is a pretty good correlation between the um, sort of how rough the uh, and effectively how many activity cliffs we have, I think is fairly equivalent to consider the two, the two ideas um, and how accurate the machine learning model uh, uh, is basically how well it captures or how well it predicts uh, the class of um, molecules in the test set. Uh, however, here you, you will actually notice that the points that are farther up, they're all fairly small in size. And so these are the smaller data sets. And this is what we kind of, I was trying to mention before that, you know, given a specific roughness, the less data you have, uh, the harder it is to, for the model to, to make accurate prediction. So we, there is this uh, sort of confounding factor of, um, you know, for kind of having a model that makes larger error for a specific, um, uh, given a specific roughness value. Yeah, go ahead, Yeah, the, can you go back to the previous slide, uh, the one before? Yeah, so in, in some cases, you have uh, the correlation being around 0 0.2 or 0 0.4. Um, yeah. What what do you make of this of these cases? Is it like, at least what does that tell you? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good uh, question. I think we have a few hypotheses. So um, in some cases, like here, random forest and uh, for zinc, I think in some cases is effectively the model that is able to discard completely some of the dimension or like some of the uh, properties. So here we have descriptors like log P or QED. And some of the property we are predicting is log P or QED or a combination of log P and QED or, or similar properties. And I think in this particular case, we might have a, um, a model like random forest, which is very capable of completely disregarding certain dimensions because it knows that only some matter. And so basically it does better than the roughness index would predict because the roughness, roughness score considers the whole, the whole space. It doesn't have any um, sort of concept of, it cannot recognize that, um, you know, log P actually is more important to predict log P than any other property. So it doesn't disregard everything else. So it looks like the landscape is still rough, but if you look at only one dimension effectively, um, it might be smooth. Um, and I think this, this is one case that can happen effectively, where you have like a couple of um, input dimensions that tells you a lot about the output and a model like random forest is very much capable of considering pretty much all of those. Um, the other cases where we have um, generally, we struggle to correlate a bit better is the Campbell dataset. So here, here we don't really have a definite answer, but I think there are a couple of hypotheses. Is it, if you look at it, it's actually, we have quite a lot of data points and you can see like it's very much blue. So what, what happens is that we have a very, very tight range of both uh, errors and, and roughness index. And I think it's just 
easy to uh, or kind of harder if you have a very tight dynamical range to to capture um, to get good correlation so if you look at the red dots so the therapeutic data commons actually quite helps to have like a couple of data sets that are very rough and then we can see you know kind of it helps capture like a get a better correlation to some extent whereas the um, the Campbell data sets are very very clustered um, and then I think it's just easier to there's just more noise so we didn't put like some uh, uncertainty, but I would imagine the uncertainty around those numbers is just much higher. Um, another speculative or speculation might be, you know, error in the experiment, um, you know, the experimental side. So it is in general anyway harder for a machine learning model maybe to capture. So, it, but I, I'm not sure about that. Um, again, we don't have a definite answer. I think the hypothesis is if we look at the 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 range of index, roughness index and error, they're all very tight. Um, and they all cluster in a very, very small space, and it's just hard to get uh, kind of from a, uh, get good statistics in terms of R square, or, or in this case, it's the Pearson correlation. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, thank you for the, for the answer. Um, one follow-up is, given um, the fact that the model can have a uh, a subspace that very smaller than the, the actual input space. Um, does it actually make sense to when we is not equity about this particular work, but like many other work? Uh, does it actually make sense to just use the input uh, space uh, dimension to compute those score, or is it better to actually compute those score in the um, from the model perspective? For example, let's take random forest. Random forest is using 10 um, features. So isn't it better to compute this score in the in the space of this 10 feature instead of the, the whole uh, space of fingerprint of descriptor? To consider the, the specific subspace. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So in this particular case, yes, you would do better and it would probably correlate better to consider the subspace. I guess the challenge to some extent here is that we didn't want to assume we would know which subspace is the most relevant. So we just consider, you know, we just said these are the descriptor, we use it for all data sets, and we assume we don't know which ones are relevant. You know, kind of we, we pretended that we didn't know what these are. It could be like number from embeddings or anything. Um, so I think if, if for, for the testing, we didn't want to bias to some extent the, the results in that way, uh, kind of by the knowledge of, of how the machine learning model performs. Um, but generally speaking, of course, yes, it, it would make sense to consider only the most relevant features. And if you do some feature importance analysis in this particular case, you would see that the random forest model would pick those two, three descriptors that are most relevant. And you, you probably would tell you that everything else um, is not really useful. Um, so that, that is true, yeah. Perfect, thank you. Let me take a look at the chats and then i think i only have a couple of more slides uh so that we should be on time uh did you observe any outlier data sets i think this is kind of what we discussed yes there are like a few cases in particular the campbell were more tough um have you tried using 3d 4d descriptors confirmations oh um no we didn't use it um there's no inherent difference again like here everything that matters is the distance matrix so you have two molecules as input and the output is a number that tells you what the distance between them is so if you have a distance matrix based on 3d 4d coordinates you know any um any property you want that's all that is needed for the input basically like a distance matrix um so we didn't we kind of picked you know a set of things that are very easy to put together and test uh, but you, you know, in, there's no restriction in in kind of in what kind of representation you might want to use or dimensionality or, or anything like that. Um, yeah. Um, the last question: Did you look into cases where the labels are highly skewed, um, categorical or continuous? How do you generalize rough indices to such data sets? Uh, that's a good point. So we didn't explicitly look into it, but I suspect that these there are data sets like that. So if we um, Kind of go back like here i guess this half light would be one case this is very skewed so um, i mean here the data points are not represented but um, if we are linearly interpolating between points so every time you kind of see like a uh, like a peak here this there will be a data point there and basically we have like three four data points with high 
uh, half-life values and everything else is pretty is pretty low. So this would be a case of a skewed data set. Um, and I think also in the classification data sets, we might have um, imbalanced, fairly imbalanced data sets. So this does not seem to be too much of an issue for the uh, for calculating this score. To some extent, it kind of helps because um, okay, I'm kind of jumping across here, but if you look at F4, this is an imbalanced data set. It's kind of easier for the model to say this is fairly smooth because most of it is fairly smooth. Um, so I, I suspect that's not too much of an issue. Um, and again, we have not kind of looked for them specifically, but I think they are within um, the sets or the data sets we, we just picked uh, for the testing. So the last two things I wanted to mention is that there is a question of convergence. So all of these roughness index values, they're all estimates, right? So we, we have a finite data set. We will not have like, um, you know, millions of compounds and we need to estimate what is the roughness based on a small data, on, on kind of a finite amount of data. So we wanted to see like how well it converges, basically how many more, you know, if it keeps changing as, you know, as long as, as you go from 10 to 100 to 1,000 to 10,000 to a million molecules, um, kind of would be very hard to use. But luckily we see that on average after 100 to 1,000 molecules, at least for this set of properties that are physical chemical properties from these guacamole oracles, uh, we tend to get a fairly converged estimate, um, um, you know, again, between 100 and 1,000 um, molecules. So here we have like the kind of uh, black dashed line would be the converged value of the ROGI score for 10,000 molecules. And here we're just taking subsets uh, of different sizes between, you know, 10, 100, 1,000, 2,000, 5,000. And we usually see that when we get to 2,000, kind of the, the one in the middle here, um, you know, all of the estimates are actually pretty close to the to the final estimate. Um, but again, this is good to keep in mind that is it, it is just an estimate. We have a small sample taken from like a larger space. And also because it's an estimate, we wanted to see whether you can measure uncertainty and a way to kind of gauge gauge confidence. Um, and bootstrap is just an easy way of doing it. Basically, you kind of resample your data set with replacement and you just compute ROGI value multiple times. And then we can see that generally speaking, if we consider the error in the uh, index in roughness index estimate uh, compared to the, again, like the ground truth would be, I think here, 10,000 data points. Um, and we compute the 95% confidence intervals. We can see there is a correlation between the kind of error estimate is not perfect, but there is a correlation between the error estimate and the error the model is making. So again, if you want to get an, an idea of how um, confident to be in the estimate, you can use uh, bootstrapping. And all of this is implemented in the, uh, GitHub, in the GitHub code. So just to have a quick summary, and then we can go for more questions. So again, what is ROGI? Is it's a fairly simple quantitative measure of structural property landscape roughness. So the advantage compared to maybe other indices is that it cannot be applied to any property. Anything you need, all you need for the input is the, um, a matrix of pairwise distances. And you can choose any representation you want to use for the molecules. Um, it Again, it's, it's, it's fairly general. It doesn't have really have um, hyperparameters. So it's kind of fixed. You don't have many choices to make. And we found generally fairly good correlation with between ROGI values and model errors, which kind of validates a bit this idea that it is actually capturing this global roughness character um, of, the, of the landscape. However, I think this is just like a, a starting point. There's a lot of other work to be done. Um, again, first, you know, these are just some ideas. Um, you know, I'm sure there are more rigorous definitions of roughness or complexity for molecular data sets or matrix spaces in general like this. Um, and again, we, we kind of took this idea of fractal dimension in a very loose way. Um, and just applied it intuitively to a molecular data sets. There probably are other ways to do this. And there are probably also a lot of, there's probably a lot of interesting theoretical work that one can do and think about how the geometry of your data sets of the space um, kind of your data set is embedded in um, affects modelability and how easy it is to learn uh, a machine learning model from it. Um, something else is, you know, in practice, um, we want to effectively optimize the molecule. Typically, a lot of molecular design uh, tasks are optimization problems. So how does this generalize to optimization? Like, of, of course, we can say how easy it is to model, and we can assume that sort of if it's easier to model, it's easier to optimize, but it might be um, interesting to make a more direct connection between uh, you know, 
um, you know, how easy it is to model a property and maybe model-based optimization, something like patient optimization. How, how many molecules should I test before uh, I, you know, I, I have a conf some confidence that I found perhaps, you know, a molecule in the top 10% that I could find or something like that. Um, and then finally, again, like all of, you know, so far we use it in a very retrospective way to analyze data sets that have been collected. Um, it's not super clear um, what are the prospective application and how useful it is in a prospective, uh, in a prospective drug discovery campaign, let's say. Um, so I think this is something that should, or like, you know, it's, it's yet to be investigated really. Um, <clears throat> and I think it applies to our score, but also in general to all of the other roughness indices or activity cliffs um, um, sort of approaches. Um, it's kind of it's kind of easy to do this retrospectively, but how can you use it prospectively? Um, again, I'm, I'm a bit fuzzy on this, uh, on this point, and I'm sure that, again, there's definitely more work one could do and more tests that can be done. Um, there's potentially interesting work to be done related to um, learn embeddings of machine learning models. Now you have a lot of self-supervised models and they might learn some representations. So it might be interesting to see how the representation evolves uh, when you train a model in an unsupervised fashion, perhaps it, you know, it gives you a representation that is fairly smooth with respect to multiple different tasks. And maybe that's why it generalizes quite well across different tasks. So right, the, all of this is kind of speculation, but could be interesting, um, interesting kind of directions for research. And so to end uh, a bit early so that we have time for question, I wanted to um, sort of thank my collaborators and in particular, David um, and Connor at MIT. Um, and as well, uh, again, Nathan as well, and also the collaborators at IBM on this work. This is just the reference uh, of the paper, and we have the implementation for this, um, so for this core um, on GitHub. And yeah, I'm, with this, I'm done. Happy to answer more questions if you have a few minutes left. Sure, uh, happy to take more questions. Uh, let's uh, Yeah, uh, thank you for the great talk. Uh, would you mind go back to slide seven? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so here I can see that you use AUC to consolidate all the uh, threshold. So I'm just wondering, like, I, I think some of the threshold probably is going to not be so useful in practice. For example, like the threshold equals to one. So just like in your Britain uh, cost line case, so like those uh, very long uh, stick probably not going to be so useful. So I'm just thinking, mm -hmm. Instead of using all threshold, maybe using like just a, a ranged uh, threshold, then just kind of range the AUC. I'm, I'm just wondering if that could help with the performance. Yes, I think you are right. Um, this is not something we tested. And to some extent, one reason not to do it might be that it introduces a, another hyperparameter that one you need to choose depending on the data set. Uh, but I think, I think it is a valid point. And I think you're right that in general for um, this concept of fractal dimension, for instance, you're right, people tend not to use the extremes. Um, the sort of super coarse and super fine, uh, they tend to kind of take a middle range, right? So that would actually um, kind of be in line with what people do in, in, in kind of other fields, perhaps. Um, but I think, yeah, here we didn't want to do it, just be just not to introduce a, a hyperparameter, which again would still depend on whether you're using fingerprints or descriptors and how you define distances. Um, so we kind of went with, okay, we just integrate across the whole space. It goes from zero to one. Um, yeah, so I think, I think that is the, um, the reason why we didn't do it, but I think there could be an argument in trying and looking only at the more intermediate, intermediate values. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have one question myself. Um, one thing, I think one usefulness of, of this uh, kind of uh, modeling indices is they help decide if you should acquire more data, for example, or if the task is too difficult to even show machine learning at, at it, right? And one thing that um, I wonder if you, you kind of come to a conclusion to, 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 uh, uh, about is what's the threshold at which uh, the rogi is telling you, okay, this is doable, you can use the machine learning, or at least a simple machine learning can do, what's the threshold at which a more sophisticated machine learning is needed, what's the threshold at which whatever the machine learning you try, it, you won't be able to 
to do something. I think that's yes, that, that is a potential application. Um, and I think you're right. You you might want to keep the representation constant, so you might have that, and then it it might be based on experience to some extent, right? You kind of the the reference, I guess, might be previous data sets. Um, so yeah, I think that's a good point. It could be an application. Something we kind of honestly struggled a little bit is that in that particular case scenario, you could also run cross validation on all those models to choose which one is more appropriate which would give you a more direct measure potentially of future performance. So maybe it would apply in cases where kind of running the whole cross-validation among many different kind of type of models might be a bit expensive. So this would be a very cheap way to kind of get an idea of how challenging the data set is and then, then pick a simpler or more complex model. So perhaps that could be, could be the case. Um, again, I don't know. It, what do you think? Does that make sense? Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I, th I guess, yeah, the, I think one of the application could end it be doing the cross validation as a way to, to select maybe like the best um, even representation because maybe in some representation space, uh, even like maybe like everything will be smooth and uh, really can be used as a way to select that. Uh, the algorithm, I think the representation is more important to this regard compared to the algorithm. So uh, yeah, this makes sense. Yeah, no, I think you're right. That is another direction which we have not explored in detail. Um, again, to some extent, we, we thought, okay, this is uh, kind of a first paper. And then I also had to, you know, kind of move on with the new job. So we wrap it up. But the um, feature, input, you know, kind of, um, feature selection to some extent, for lack of a better term, I guess, choosing the representation that gives you maybe like a more smooth landscape uh, for your particular task or for different tasks, if you want something a bit more general, um, could be could be perhaps an application. Um, again, in particular, again, maybe thinking about this kind of pre-trained models, and then you want generality across different tasks, so kind of smoothness across a few different data sets or across a few different properties might be, um, might be of interest, and then I got just running cross-validation across everything and, and you know, might, might take some time, whereas this is a very cheap proxy um, yeah. to have, yeah. Yeah, I found this also very uh, interesting and definitely worth doing because like one thing with this large language model these days is that we we assume there'll be a transition ship where we'll be raising the same representation learn over and over and um, yeah, definitely computing this tell us if like is actually worth using it over and over or is too specific to the to the task it has been trained pre trained on so yeah that's a very nice application that's true yeah um maybe you could take uh the one or two question in the chat and then we can call it today yes so let me see i think yeah there's one more question in the chat um there could be totomers or stereoisomers in the data um, maybe descriptive computation change, something you tried? No, so we didn't look at uh, totemers um, or, or kind of other stereoisomers. Um, to some extent, it doesn't really change the, um, the idea too much. Basically, every molecule or like every object, let's say that is a molecule that you want to consider a set, you know, want to consider a separate object. So you can say, well, I have totomers and might be interconverting between them in solution. So you could consider this a single object and assign a um, sort of this set of descriptors or like a, a representation to them. And then you can compute distances to all of other, other, other molecules, or you could consider them separate molecules if you want to have different stereoisomers. Um, so we have not looked into them. Um, but it doesn't really change the framework in the sense that as long as you can define, you have a distance and you know you, you have maybe some geometrical property that tells you that um, one stereoisomer has a different geometry than another stereoisomer um, and you can measure a distance between them, you can apply the, you can apply the approach. Um, maybe it would be interesting to test on a, on a data set with a lot of stereoisomers because I would assume probably those might be the nearest neighbor pairs quite often. Um, and they might have very different properties. So those might be fairly rough in terms of data sets, um, you know, kind of, a, again, activity cliff-like. 
So I think that might be interesting, but it's not something we looked into explicitly. Um, at the same time, again, like the framework is general enough that you can apply to uh, molecules with multiple tautomers. Um, and then I guess it's up to the person and the researcher how you want to model it kind of as a single uh, sort of instance or as a multi-instance uh, uh, of the same, the multiple instances of the same molecule. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, the PKA changes affect admin properties. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So um, again, here we just look at, you know, we took fingerprint descriptor with, um, you know, RDK. We didn't really compute PKA values, but you could compute PKA values, have different molecules with different PKAs, um, you know, compute descriptors for two molecules with different protonation states, and then you would consider them two different molecules, um, for instance. Um, you can you can do that. Um, so again, I think I think it's all valid. Um, we didn't look into it just because again, like um, it's just a different is a different case scenario. Um, but you would use the index in exactly the same way as long as you have n objects and you can apply uh, pairwise distances between them. And these objects are molecules, but it could be molecules with different protonation states, different tautomers. Um, so yeah, I mean, but that that definitely it would apply to admit modeling exactly. Uh, where maybe like having, you know, separating out molecules by tautomers or considering multiple tautomers and protonation states might might matter. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a good point. Uh, but we didn't look into that explicitly just because we focused on the more kind of general framework and then it can be applied um, to a lot of different scenarios and we just chose the data sets um, that were kind of readily available, like the therapeutic data commons is kind of uh, a nice place with a lot of uh, sort of data sets that you can, uh, you can use. 